Because he shuts down the government, so we have no security. So I just get out of jail. I hope he quits doing crazy stuff before my wife is completely insane. She spends a day watching like. Okay. MSNBC oh, and yeah. all that stuff. Do you have to pick it up? What did you do today? It's like, I don't want to know. Don't even tell me. Are we at war with anybody? Then I don't want to know. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Oh. That's great. She's told me, you know this person. I go, who's that? Well, that's the Undersecretary of Health and Education. So she's, she's, she's never even going to go to the board. She knows everything. Yeah. 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 What well, Drew, mission accomplished. You got it working. Yeah. 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 Civil Church is miracle. constantly rebooted and tell it to suck. Yeah, yeah. 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 turn it on, turn it off, and that'll help. Yeah. 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 Well, my IT department says, did you turn it on and off? I said, no. So now I always do that before I call them. Yes, At least twice. Yes. Always the default. The hard boot, not the cold boot. No, teach it. Can't be a warm has to be a cold boot. Teach it who's boss. Unplug it and turn it on. Threaten it with an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> no, threaten it with an apple. If you're not good, we'll replace you with a good All right, let's get started. Len is in Yakima. Uh, he's watching remotely, he said. All right. Yeah. We have Alice Chow, who's one of our awesome fellows, who has the narrow topic of the allergen immunotherapy today. So she's going to cover it all for us. We'll take a break. It'll happen. Yeah. This is supposed to be a two day fun. seminar. Here. Yeah, it's a yeah. two day series that I shoved into one PowerPoint. Um, two eight. day series. <laughs> into one hour. It's great. Overnight, actually. Yeah, well, at least it was supposed to be over two hours, and now it's over one hour. So um, today we're going to talk about basically. Subcutaneous versus sublingual therapy, and um, basically the comparison of efficacy, the safety profiles, as well in comparison, as well as briefly the mechanism of action of SLIT. No disclosures. Surprise. Okay, so Just let's start a little bit with some brief history um, about immunotherapy. You know, so back in about 200 years ago. Bo Stock actually published in 1819 um, the identification of occurrence of hay fever. Almost 100 years after that, um, I just realized that the video is um, steering part of the well, part, steering part of the, um, the picture, so I apologize for that. Um, so nearly 100 years later, uh, Richet and Poitier discovered uh, anaphylaxis. It was this, this difficult to understand phenomenon for them that um, you could actually have a protective immune system actually be harmful to the body. Uh, they discovered this by studying um, toxicity of jellyfish in dogs. Dunbar then the following year confirmed Bostock's uh, pollen theory, and um, he performed this by exposing pollen to mucosal membranes and skin that resulted in a reaction. Um, he also injected animals with pollen and was able to find that it formed an antitoxin. Um, in 1911, this was a big year, both Noon and then later in the year, Freeman and Lancet, uh, they actually demonstrated that inoculation of patients uh, with pollen um, successfully were able to give the patients some benefits symptomatically for their hay fever symptoms. Um, this figure is actually from Noon's paper. It describes uh, basically, I think it's three patients. Um, it's, it was a little difficult to understand his uh, description. But this is one patient, and this is the same patient later on that year. Um, this is the response to, that patient's response to the therapy. Not really clear what the, um, his indices are here. And this is yet another patient in their treatment therapy. I unfortunately was not able to find the Freeman paper to demonstrate his uh, findings. So allergens or physicians at least started to apply this technique to different allergens, uh, such as perennial, um, including dust mite and anilodander, as well as for asthma treatment. Double-blind studies performed by Franklin in August in England in the 1950s and then in the 1960s in the United States by Franklin and Lowell um, 
they confirmed that allergen immunotherapy is a viable therapy. Newly established initially this weekly incremental dose that we've been using uh, with the maintenance uh, for years, and basically everybody's been following this model there on afterwards. So now we use allergen immunotherapy to support many, many different things, as we all know. Uh, pollens for rhinitis conjunctivitis, dust mites for asthma and rhinitis, domestic pet dander, especially for cats, um, for asthma, uh, cockroach, which is a more newly identified uh, allergen uh, that typically affects those in the inner city asthmatics and has been theorized to be in the warmer climates. Um, venom for systemic reactions, uh, latex for cutaneous as well as asthma. Um, unfortunately, which we'll get into a little bit later, there was one placebo controlled study uh, with teenage respiratory symptoms that actually had 8% of systemic reactions. We'll talk about how that's astronomically high. Um, but as a result, they don't, we don't recommend using uh, latex immunotherapy as a result of that. And then fungi, uh, which there's been a lot of difficulties with immunotherapy as there are hundreds of thousands of different species. We really don't understand exposure patterns and most, especially to most of the species. Um, fungal extracts are variable in quality, likely due to the high rate of somatic mutation and high photolytic enzyme content. Also, many of them don't grow in artificial media, and so we don't really have extracts available. However, there have been studies um, done to treat asthmatics with the outdoor seasonal fungi, Clasporidium and Alternaria, and um, that's been successful, and so we continue to do so. Um, and that these also have applications to rhinitis. So, talking about uh, a CIT efficacy in allergic rhinitis, um, there's been some great meta analyses. Uh, most prominent one was the Cochrane Review in 2007 by Calderon. Uh, it summarized 51 studies that spanned it into a few three days, surprisingly, to three years. Um, sample size was Pretty good, 1,645 of active uh, arm, and then the 1,226 in the placebo, with a nice smattering of various um, monotherapy studies that, that were included. Um, 15 of the trials included symptom scores, and 13 of the trials with medication, had medication scores. So since all of the trials have used different types of scoring methods, um, they have used a very common uh, method to normalize called the standard mean. And so the symptom score is actually improved by uh, negative 0.73, which is quite good, SMD, um, for people on a CIT versus placebo. Medication score improved 0.57, negative 0.57, and epinephrine was given to 19 out of 14,000 injections, which is uh, a rate of 0.13% per injection. And then only one out of 8,278 patients uh, on placebo received epinephrine. That's 0.01%. Uh, There's been some debate about whether or not we should be treating patients with monotherapy or multiple therapy. Um, most of the double blood placebo controlled studies have actually used only single allergen extracts. Um, and hence, the Europeans actually don't recommend the mixture of allergens. But as we're here in the United States, um, our practice parameter established that we're actually okay with this. And um, there's been some, some literature supporting this. Um, Lowell and Franklin that we spoke about earlier um, basically studied ragweed amongst other allergens. And when they decreased or removed ragweed extract, it actually resulted in increased symptoms in the patients. Johnson and Krupp, also in the 1960s, used um, an allergen mixture and it was effectively treating asthma. And then Reed in 1986 uh, performed a mixture with grass that was also effectively treating asthma. Um, for the treatment of asthma, Abramson, uh, all and Cochrane in 2010 uh, published a meta analysis of 88 studies uh, with 3792 patients. Um, they identified that of these 3,459 had asthma, and unfortunately they did not identify how many placebo patients were involved. Uh, the great majority of these, these studies include 
uh, dust mite. However, they also had two representing latex, um, and then six with multiple allergens. There was improvement in not only asthma symptoms, but the medication scores as well as bronchial hyperreactivity. The symptom scores improved uh, by negative 0.59. Uh, the number needed to treat was, for Paul was actually only three, dander three, and dust might a little bit higher at six. There was no consistent effect on lung function, however, but they were able to find that the bronchial hyperactivity did improve, um, not so much for the non-specific triggers with only negative 0.35, but much more so for the other specific as we would expect with uh, negative 0.61. One out of 16 patients developed a local adverse reaction, and one out of nine patients developed a systemic reaction of any sort of severity. <clears throat> um, this has been also up to some debate, the efficacy of uh, immunotherapy with atopic dermatitis. Bay et al. and Jackie uh, published an analysis in 2013. Um, they summarized eight studies, six of which were actually subcutaneous, and two of which were sublingual. Um, Sample size was small with only 385 patients in total, with the active arm only consisting of 219 patients. Six of the studies uh, studied the patients for greater than a year. Um, there were two studies that uh, were less than a year. This was for four months, and this the last red star was for uh, eight months. For these studies were a pediatric population one in an adult, and three combined age groups. Um, as you can see, the fourth plot, unfortunately, some of this is cut off, but the great majority actually is to the right of uh, the line indicating that uh, it actually favors therapy. The odds ratio was 5.35, which is quite good. Um, actually, better than just quite good. However, the sample was quite heterogeneous with an I squared of what were the allergens? Were they mostly cats, dogs, dust mites, or were they? Yeah, uh, they, trying to think. Um, <coughs> what's the right way to make papers? I think um, it was mostly like, yes, it was cat and dust mite for the two main ones. And do you know, did they require a certain level of severity for the atopic dermatitis? Or? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was moderate to severe. And then and then there was a separate like we'll talk about now that actually looked only at the severe. Um, so five of the studies only really broke it down um, to examine those patients who had failed therapy um, otherwise. And the heterogeneity actually proved significant. It was only 52%. Um, odds ratio was still very good at 3.13. And um, unfortunately, this is cut off.
and they recently developed tablets to standardize and make dosing more reliable instead of using calibrated droppers. Um, an example of how they will extract allergens is they use a ammonium bicarbonate solution, ultrafiltrate the sample, sterilize, filtrate it, and then lyophilize it. Um, the concentration is measured by global IG binding via either RAST or ELISA, and then they reconstitute it such that um, the amount of therapy is 100 index of fertility uh, per milliliters, um, and that's the amount where it's a very specific uh, definition where it, in 30 patients, it'll elicit an average diameter, a mean diameter of 7 milliliters. Um, there are now four sublingual therapies approved in the United States uh, in breast and abroad was actually approved back in 2009. Um, in the U.S., uh, there's a single therapy with Timothy Brass by the Merck called Brastec, um, and it was improved by the FDA in 2014 for ages greater than five. Um, and then there's a mixed five pollen uh, brass tablet that's made by Stellar Cheats. That was also approved by FDA in 2014 for ages five or greater. Um, short Ragweed or rag, Ragatech is made by Merck, and it was approved in 2014 for adults under the age of 65 years. And Dustmite, um, also known as Odactra here in the United States, is made by AKL, ALK Abello, and that was approved in March of um, dosing equivalence has, it's very, very, very variable. Um, in fact, a lot of these, it's really not known how they actually were able to describe or determine the dosing equivalence. Um, there was a pu paper published relatively recently that demonstrated um, the, the European versus Un United States manufacturers. There's actually a 7 to 200 fold difference in concentration between um, the dust mite, Timothy grass, cat, and rag. Um, for grass tech, they use 1,000 BAUs per milliliters, um, and that induces an intradermal wheel that adds up to being 50 millimeters when you add the two perpendicular diameters of the wheel. Um, so for one of the grass tablets, it's 2,800 BAUs, and that's equivalent to about 15 micrograms of PHLP5, and then the other tablet uses the, the stand, uh, standard qualitative um, unit, which is of 75,000, which is equivalent to 2,800 BAUs. And SQT is supposed to be this manufacturer's in-house standardization therapy. Um, for the five black cross tablet, or oral air, there are two dosages, um, 100 IRs and 200 IRs, plus 100 IRs is for the pediatric uh, ramping of dosing. And um, the 100 IR is equivalent to, as we, as we just talked about, um, eliciting a skin prep wheel of seven millimeters and 30 patients. Uh, ragweed, they look at A and B, A1 units, um, and each unit is equivalent to one microgram. The tablets are 12 micrograms. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, the tiles are 12 micrograms, or sorry, 12 units, but the um, oral solution that's available in Europe for rabbit treatment actually is 50 units. So they're not really clear why the 50 units is better tolerated in the oral solution form versus the tablet form. Um, and then for dust mite um, with Dactra, uh, that's the use of the standard quantity as well, and that's about 15 micrograms per tablet. This was um, confirmed by radial immunodiffusion as well as ELISA. For grass, um, basically the vast, vast majority of the uh, literature is, is focused on grass. That's what we know the most about, so that's what we're going to talk about today, uh, or focus on today. In 2006, Dahl et al. Uh, and Jack published a paper that confirmed the efficacy of grass sublingual immunotherapy. They treated patients for a period of over two years um, using Grasex. This uh, was performed in Europe. Um, randomized controlled trials with 51 centers from eight countries.
countries uh, was the study that was performed. Um, this actually ended up being a phase three trial for Brazos. 634 patients in total were um, in the study, and there was um, they included patients who with moderate to severe grass pollen induced allergic reaction dermatitis with or without asthma, and in an adequately controlled uh, symptoms by medications. So the symptom score improved by 30%, medication score improved by 38%. 84% um, of the patients had one or more adverse event. Most of them were localized and mild, and um, all of them were able to be treated by either nonsteroidal or anti-inflammatories or um, oral antihistamines. 16 of the patients from the active arm withdrew from the study uh, due to side effects, except as I just said, they were all basically lo localized reactions. Eight patients, or 2.5%, um, withdrew from the placebo arm, and no um, reactions required of the method. In 2012, the same group, um, this time Dahl was the senior author, uh, published in Jackie the follow-up of their phase two trial, which is that they looked at, after the two year, after the three-year period of treatment, they looked two years later um, to see if the benefits uh, continued. Um, and only this time, 238 patients completed the entire study. The symptom score improved uh, by 25 to 36 percent. Medication score 20 to 45 percent. And um, the adverse offense, uh, this time they elected to not tell us the total amount of people who had adverse events. Instead, they elected to tell us the breakdown. Um, so the local reactions, uh, the four most common were oral pruritus at 44% in the active mouth edema, 19% um, in the active arm versus 1% of the placebo, throat irritation, 13% in the active, 2% of the placebo, ear pruritus, 12% in the active, and 1%. Um, two more patients withdrew the latter half of the active uh, part of therapy. Um, so a total of 18 patients withdrawn from the active arm. No further patients withdrew after they completed the three years of therapy. Um, placebo branch, 11 patients withdrew. One patient actually died, and this was uh, overall, it was 3.5%, I'm sorry, that they were cut off. But the one patient that died, uh, died from an unrelated circumstance with a subarachnoid. Um, otherwise, no serious events. Um, most recently, there was a large meta-analysis uh, published by Devona et al. in JAMA um, in 2015. It summarized 15 RCTs uh, with mixed therapy of either the five breast tablets or the monotherapies. Um, 13 of these trials had symptom scores, and the end size was very good. And to the 4,700, uh, and 12 trials had medication scores. Um, the symptom score improved mildly by 0.28, medication score by 0.24. And um, again, we demonstrate that 61% of patients who actively received treatment um, had local adverse effects uh, versus, or had adverse effects, I'm sorry, versus uh, placebo, which is 20, 0.9%. Seven in patients in this treatment group um, also require epinephrine. So I also wanted to talk about here, actually, take a side note. Um, there was actually a retrospective analysis of six breast studies in 2013 by Nelson. Um, with breast tech, and they actually show that using just the single therapy um, actually was beneficial for even if you had grass allergies to other kinds of grasses. Um, and they, the patients actually had both improvements in both symptom and medication scores. And then for the pediatric population, um, there was one meta analysis uh, where they looked at three studies, all of which had greater 200 patients in Europe and North America, and children also benefited. An allergic and asthma sampling. 
it looked like in your first couple studies there were no patients in the active arm that needed epinephrine, and in this one there were seven. Yeah. Did they comment about changing in doses or changing in anything else? No. That was, yeah. It was, uh, later, uh, I'll show you the, uh, there's a figure that summarizes all that a little later, and I can show you that. It was kind of interesting. They talked about maybe why that was the case, but they don't really go into yeah, um, why that wasn't summarized in the doll, doll papers. Um, so this is the just a summary of the SMD for the SMD score. Nice odds ratio with the with everything falling on the left, and the same for the medication score with all these. Um, there more recently has been more uh, literature published about dust mite treatment as well as ragweed. Um, one of the formulations of, of the tablets reduced the allergic burning symptoms in uh, dust mite sufferers by 17.9% in one treatment year, and it continued to reduce symptoms by 17% the following year. Um, and then the other treatment form uh, reduced the risk of asthma exacerbation compared to placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.69. Ragweed, um, it reduced um, AR symptoms by 26% and reduced uh, medication related symptoms by 43. Um, Slit efficacy in asthma, not as well demonstrated yet. Um, Cochrane released a meta analysis in 2015. Um, concluded studies documenting any severity of asthma. Most of the patients were mild to intermittent. Um, and the studies recruited asthmatics, rhinitis patients, or both, as long as 80% of the patients or greater um, had asthma. There are 52 studies between one day and three years. I don't know where, why some of these are like one day, three day. We all know that this is not It's a damn good drug. Um, one day, one day. <laughs> Studies were only looked at adults, 25 only at children, um, and the remaining nine recruited either both or did not specify. And the trend was very good at 5,000 subjects. Um, fortunately, this again did not break down how many patients received placebo versus um, after treatment. One says he can't hear, so he's asking for the mic. <laughs> Just because he's in Tri Cities. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. This is Sorry, Len. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, there's a very, despite this large number of subjects, there's a large vari variation as most of the symptom medication scores were not validated that were used. Um, they were able to determine that there was a decrease in medication dose change of uh, 35.1 micrograms per day. But as you can see, the confidence interval is quite large between negative 50 and 120. Um, Exacerbations of chronic oral steroids were uh, documented in two studies and no events were uh, documented. And bronchial complication improved by 0.69, which is also not the, the, the um, data behind that was also very poor. Odds um, ratio of adverse events was 1.7, um, with 1,785 participants. Participants in 19 studies uh, um, with adverse events, but most were transient and mild. Very few serious adverse events were reported, and we don't talk about who needed epinephrine. To, so this is the the slide, also the figure I was talking about earlier. Um, so this is the paper from the Debono Debono group. Um, so 61%, as we talked about, had um, treatment-related adverse effects, and then for some reason, seven of them had required epinephrine. This comes to about 0.3% of the injections requiring epi. Um, they talk about maybe it's because the patients are self-administering the epinephrine, Guidelines about, um, or uniform guidelines, I should say, that, about 
about when an amendment should be, be given, that we talked about a couple weeks ago, the Europeans versus um, the North Americans using a different guideline for uh, the Northern administration and the initial papers documenting efficacy when performed all in Europe uh, versus this uh, cohort actually summarizes both American, North American and European studies. So that could be, that was another reason that they came up with. Um, this is a, this is, again, uh, in comparison to the cutaneous therapy, this uh, chart is actually from Iverson's paper that I talked about uh, um, back in 2010 from the, the SCAT and asthma meta-analysis. And um, this chart is actually a conglomeration of something like four large uh, meta-analyses talking uh, and their evaluation of the efforts of events and related to subcutaneous therapy. Um, and per injection, it was 0.7 to 4%. Patients had local reactions, 0.06 to 1% um, with systemic reactions. And it's not really clear from that which one of these systemic reactions required the number for fatal reactions that's hidden behind your mask? One like, for 2.5 million. million. One in 2.5 million? Yes. Right. Okay. Do you know on the slit requiring epi, were they all pollens? I'm just curious. Or did they talk about that? Yeah, this was all from for us. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And any linkage with, like, during the grass season? Um, no, they were all uh, given so after. They get, you only give it during grass season, though. Oh. Subliminal grass, I thought it was just a couple oh. Started about three months before. I'm just curious if. Yeah, most of the studies like started like 12 months before, <coughs> right. and um, most of them were given on day one. Right. Um, there's a paper about actual epinephrine use and slit. Um, because I had that question why why those are going to be So, Nolte and Jackson got this in 2016. Um, performed a. Basically, this is their aggregation of the phase one through phase three trial data. So uh, there were 29 studies in total covering North America, Europe, and Japan. Um, they looked at uh, Timothy Grass, short ragweed, and Desmite. Uh, in Timothy Grass, uh, there were 2,500 active participants and 21 patients with the placebo arm. Uh, 13 times uh, the network was used. 10 in the active and 3 in placebo. Uh, four of these were for systemic reactions and four for local reactions. Um, in the ragweed studies, uh, epinephrine was used nine times in eight patients, um, seven patients in the active arm and placebo one. Um, the one The one uh, that was for the the placebo um, was actually the patient who received it twice, and it's for a sustained uh, adverse rea uh, systemic reaction. Um, otherwise, uh, for those receiving adjuvant treatment in the ragweed groups, uh, one was for systemic reaction and three for local. Uh, in the dust mite, um, thirteen. Epinephrine injections were given uh, eight in the active, five in placebo. Um, one was for systemic reaction and three for local reactions. And then, kind of covering back to what you're asking, Dr. Varad, um, this one addresses in more detail. Uh, they summarized that there were 16 total uh, administrations of epinephrine that were given. Uh, 11 are covered in the first week of treatment, seven purely on day one, uh, with five self administered. Um, after day one, six were for severe adverse reactions. Uh, swelling and throat irritation on day three, anaphylaxis is day six, throat tightness on day seven, throat tightness on day 14, <coughs> pharyngeal edema on day 22, and swollen dung on day 74. And, and was there any comment about, it sounds like the primary thing was the sense of severe upper airway yeah. stuff, not diffuse hives or wheezing. Exactly. Yeah. There was actually no documentation. Jackie Practice, uh, 2017, had a great paper that talked about the link of therapies. Um, and it just looks like we've, uh, this 
studies have a grade of three years for grass, greater than 12 months for or, um, dust mite and ragweed so far. Uh, to talk a little bit about the mechanism of the action um, of immunotherapy, as we know, um, APCs in the local area of uh, the allergen administration pick up the proteins and bring Cells. Um, T reds have been actually shown to be highly involved. They're trying to figure out more recently why T reds are involved in allergen immunotherapy, not so much in uh, inhaled pollen um, exposures. And one of the studies um, actually was talking about how when they injected with a, the aqueous solution, um, the proteins don't break up as much, and so they're larger and they were actually detected by the APCs better. That's their theory, at least, because when they looked at uh, pollen exposures and by inhalant, um, what was interesting was is that it was theorized that it just kind of disperses within the mucosal membrane, and as a result, the T reds don't become activated to uh, the antigen presentation. In um, subcutaneous tissue, these um, proteins are picked up by dendritic cells. In the mouth, they're actually picked up by oral mucosal link. Um, there was a great study that was published in Jackie in 2010 by Alan et al. Um, they initially, the year prior, had published a study looking at PHLP5 uptake in mice, um, where they found that most of the FITC labeled allergen was absorbed after swallowing uh, peaks in the plasma one to two hours after ingestion. Um, it can actually persist in the oral cavity for up to 20 hours. And what was interesting is if you don't retain the, the, um, the drops or the tablets within the sublingual um, space for at least two minutes and you only just swallow the, the pills, um, there's actually less, less benefit. Um, so then in 2010, they actually took um, mucosal biopsies. They had oral surgeons in 14 patients with uh, grass allergies and the nine patients without grass allergies. And um, they went and took mucosal biopsies during other operative procedures. Uh, they looked for patches of uh, mucosa that was not inflamed. And um, they used these mucosa to actually examine to see the action of um, the Langerhans cells of taking the PHLP5. And as we see, this is. Um, the, this is um, the amount of uptake by the Linhan cells after um, the length of incubation. So overall, they found no difference in the protein binding patients with or without grass pollen allergies. Um, interestingly, they found a dawn regulation of the FC epsilon receptor. They weren't able to account for that. And they also demonstrated dose-dependent binding Um, upon binding, the Langerhans cells actually increase mobility. Um, this figure demonstrates uh, the difference between grass pollen allergic versus the non atopic cohort um, from the mucosal biopsies. Um, we form this study in both forest degrees Celsius as well as 37 degrees Celsius, and their control with de was dextran, as dextran has a similar uptake. Um, to proteins such as PHLP5. Um, and this is just demonstrating that they're overall very similar between the, the two cohorts of um, allergic versus non allergic and the amount of mobility of the linear hand cells. Um, T cell expression. So what's interesting is, is that upon exposure of the linear hand cells to the PHLP5, um, they actually start to produce IL-10 and TGF beta. Um, so then they looked at the T cell expression and cytokine expression in the localized area, and they actually found that they, these cells are able to induce the uh, localized T cells uh, to also express 
um, IL-10 and TGF beta. And then in conclusion, um, many conclusions. Basically, it looks like overall slit has equal efficacy to subcutaneous therapy. Uh, we've known for decades that uh, allogeminotherapy has been good for uh, allergic round conjunctivitis, asthma, and atopic dermatitis, but we're still trying to figure out how good subcutaneous therapy is for asthma and atopic dermatitis. Um, there's comparable or lower incidence of serious reverse reactions uh, of SLIT to SCIT. <coughs> However, the great majority of patients do have localized reactions to subcutaneous therapy, um, and that may not be acceptable to many patients. And we still have a lot of work to do to really look at the length of therapy for these um, uh, these medications, um, as well as especially in SLIT and Alzheimer's other antigens by SLIT, possibly. Um, we talked about others with other trees and whatnot that have not been applied yet, at least to more marketed um, form yet. Um, maybe SLIT by other forms uh, with mucohesis, allergoids, or adjuvants to allow for better uptake and better allergenic, or not allergenic, better reaction of the immune system to these proteins. And then um, we still need to figure out further how exactly SLIT works, because you would think that um, if you swallow the pill, that might be better, right? Because, um, or the drops, because there's a lot of lymphoid tissue in the gut mucosa, and yet for some reason, these uh, therapies work better when you administer the, the proteins locally in the mouth. And then, references. Are there any studies with cat and dog? Doing um, it this way instead of just mites and ragweed and grass? Not. Not, not substantive. There are, but not substantive. Uh, yeah. In your conclusion, you mentioned like there is an overall equal efficacy. I mean, I don't. I mean, the, they never get head-to-head -head trial between the two. And there's no, yeah. and there's. No, I mean, I see like there's also no. I mean, the thirty percent symptom improvement versus seventy percent with the subcutaneous immunotherapy. So, I mean, I just kind of wonder how is that conclusion followed. Yeah, well, the SCD yeah. scores, though, are actually pretty typical. They're all no. uh, about negative seven. Now, uh, Hel Hel Nelson talked at the Northwest Allergy Forum a few years ago about this, and it is apples and oranges a bit, and obviously it would be impossible for patients to be their own controls, right? In other words, doing this and doing that. Uh, but it sort of favors Skip, is what his conclusion was. The other issue is... When you stop slit versus stopping skit after, say, four years, there's no question, I think, that patients like with grass allergy get symptomatic quicker yeah. than patients Yeah, I, I love that on, part out there. There was a study that looked at, uh, at the end of, like, yeah. five years. Um, the, they attribute to that the, there were lower amounts of uh, local grass pollens that year, but yeah. I don't know if you can really make that assumption. If you look at the total dose of allergen that we actually give them in these yeah. two different processes, how much more allergen do you give them with sublingual versus subcutaneous? That's a really good question. And is it a hundredfold more, a thousandfold more? How much more? So it's like 15 micrograms. Is, I, I feel like it was like the typical um, protein amount, at least a sublingual. I'm not sure how much is given in the subcutaneous form. That's sure. 365 days a year. So it's yeah. a lot of protein. It's a lot of protein. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the other caveat, at least from the grass studies, is they showed, like, if you gave perennial therapy uh, for, for three years, you've got a fourth year of benefit. If you just give pre-seasonal and seasonal, so about six months, uh, again, it's kind of gone the next year. But if you do the math over four years, uh, you know, it, it's 24 months versus 36, so it, it, to me it's more economically feasible to give it like February through July yearly rather than the perennial. Does that make sense? It's like 30, 30% cheaper. And then speaking of cost, yeah, there's yeah. the issue of cost. It's a lot more expensive than 
It's funny because when you talk about local reactions, I keep thinking of local shot reactions in their arm, and you're yes. talking about in their throat. Yeah, yeah. Which is a yeah. 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 yeah, I know. Their local reactions are a little bit different. Personally, after the first, even though you're starting in February, like for grass, after the first few trials and, you know, statistics creep in, I've started patients on non sedating antihistamines for the first couple of weeks. And then they seem to tolerate, and I, I think it's cut down. People saying, "Oh, I'm not doing this anymore." Is anyone doing slip with multiple allergens? Well, that was studied in Italy, I think, more than anything, and it didn't go well. Yeah. Yeah, like was, yeah. like birch and grass overlapping. They had a lot more. Uh, yeah, there was one study, and yeah. they had a lot. I was always intrigued because Europeans find all these monosensitized people. I never see. No, them. I know. Yeah, they're they're just allergic to grass. I have like one in a thousand people that I see is maybe just allergic to grass, and I don't know where they live in the United States. There must be some here, but none of them live in Everett. I don't know where they live. <laughs> so I was always curious how they can find these people because I can't. Yeah, find I was actually wondering about that too. They all live in Carnation. Carnation. against Carnation. I know. The other thing with all of our new DNA technology, and this may be more addressed to you guys than us old guys, but now that you're finding what cells are sensitized and what cells retain allergen in the mouth and all that, has somebody thought about taking them out and cloning those cells and exposing them in vitro to this stuff and see if we can do like a CAR T cell thing with this? Figure out what antibody we need to put on there and then clone those cells up and re-inject them back into the patient. I haven't seen that quite yet. <laughs> that's right. No. Okay. You think about it, we get rid of all the anaphylaxis, we just sensitize their cells in tissue culture and inject them. But probably only costs a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Is that your retirement question? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> 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 the question would be what are you doing? These are going to target the, the, the T-Rex, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious if anybody's actually done that yet. Houses or something that they could just do it and do oh, well, well. Nitro and just stick the cells back. Anyway, well, thank you. That's a great review. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I wish they had cat and dog. Yeah. Yeah. Dog. Well, I think birds. Look, there's a dog right there. Yeah. <laughs> Go in the room for ten minutes. With the dog. <laughs> to survive. Uh, Go lick your dog, and that's how you yeah, do the dog with you. Yeah. Oh, birch is allegedly coming. Is there any reason to do more than one?